Hello, everybody, and welcome to this new appointment with the AIM Seminars. It's a great honor to have with us Gabriel Piré. Gabriel Piré is a senior researcher at the CNRS, working at the Ecole Normale Superior on Artificial Intelligence. His topics of interest include optimal transport, imaging sciences, and machine learning. He got a PhD in mathematics at the Ecole Polytechnique Center for Applied Mathematics in 2005 and joined the CNRS as a research fellow in the University of Paris in 2006. In, in 2012, he won an ERC starting grant with the Sigma Vision Project and in 2017, an ERC consolidator grant with the Denoia Project. In the same year, he won the Blaise Pascal Prize from the Academy of Sciences and in 2019, the Magenes Prize from the Italian Mathematical Union. In 2021, he got the CNRS Silver Medal. He is Deputy Director of the Paris AI Research Institute, which is one of the four French institutes of artificial intelligence created as a part of the National French Initiative on AI, announced by President Emmanuel Macron on May 29, 2018. And now, I will now hand the floor over to our guest. Thanks you again, Gabriel. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Italia. I hope uh, you hear me well. Let me know if there is uh, any problems. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm really glad to do this presentation. I'm going to make a bit of a tutorial talk, I would say, on optimal transport and try to explain why I think it could be useful for, for machine learning and discuss pot potential sorry, issues in a in high dimensional setup. Uh, so if you want to know more about what I would say today, uh, we have written a small book uh, with Marco Cuturi. So if you Google uh, computational optimal transport, you should find it easily. It's a free PDF that you can download and also point us to uh, Python codes. And we are more than welcome to use this code. I think it's a great opportunity to learn about uh, mathematics and, and uh, machine learning together using uh, optimal transport. So uh, what is the topic? Uh, what are the questions to address? The questions are uh, related uh, to comparison, I would say, of point cloud or more general probability distribution. And this is a question that arises almost everywhere in data science. Could be for low dimensional problem like image processing, signal processing, on the left, it's an example of tracking signal activity on the brain. Could be for higher dimensional problem like uh, natural language processing, where we represent uh, text as uh, basically uh, vectors in a high dimensional space, and you want to translate the text or you want to compute uh, some kind of features to represent this text. Could be for vision task, where you want to do uh, machine learning over billions of, of images viewed as points. Uh, of course, for classical tasks, uh, this is, of course, very useful, like uh, retrieval of images, classification of images, but for also generative model of images, you'd like to understand the distribution of, of this large uh, set of images. Uh, another type uh, of application that I'm very involved in interest is uh, single cell uh, omics, genomics, where you represent each cell as a point over a space of genes, and you'd like to understand the evolution, for instance, when there is a disease, and also in the early stage of development uh, uh, of an embryo, you'd like to understand how this uh, set of points will deform. And once again, you have, you'd like to use some uh, mathematical tools for this. So in a very, I would say, high level um, type of question, what you are given as input is a point cloud, a set of, of, of data, basically beta. And typically, in all these scenarios, you want to model or to capture this point cloud using some uh, probabilistic model or some uh, parameterized uh, family of distribution, alpha that depend on theta. And the goal is to uh, modify the parameter theta so that this template become as close as possible from the input. So somehow, the core question that I would like to address today is about the choice of this discrepancy capital D uh, that you would use to compare uh, basically this uh, set of points and you'd like to, to, to minimize it. And the key insight I would say of this talk is that in all these applications and in many more, actually the points, they belong to some embedding space. There is some underlying geometry, some uh, cost D between points and optimal transport, you should think of this as some kind of a mathematical method that takes as input this uh, little D, D of X, Y between two points and immediately maps it automatically, I would say, 
to a discrepancy capital D between groups of points. And this is what I, I want to discuss today, how to, 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 to do this. Uh, I forgot to say this, but please stop me anytime if you have questions, something is not clear, you want more details. I try also to monitor the chat uh, as much as, as I can, uh, but feel free to interrupt me also during the talk. Okay, so this is like uh, the general motivation, I would say, for optimal transport. Uh, let's come back to a bit of a history of optimal transport, uh, kind of a historical uh, presentation today, uh, starting, of course, by the pioneer work of uh, Gaspard Monge, uh, um, almost just after the revolution. So Gaspard Monge is really uh, an amazing mathematician and political uh, figure of the revolution. And then he, he went with Napoleon and he, he, he went to Egypt. So there's a lo very long story about him. But among the many problems he discovered, there is this very simple question of optimal matching. You have two sets of points and you want to compute the best permutation, sigma, so that it minimizes the sum of travel distance. So for Monge, motivation was really for military application. But it's like a universal, one of the, of the most universal question, I would say, about assigning uh, two sets of points together. So obviously, it's very simple to, to ask. But even Monge itself was convinced, at least at its time, it was very hard to solve. Because the number of, of possibilities is enormous. Like even if, if n is of the order of 50, you have more uh, permutation than atom in the universe. So it looks like a uh, brute force approach cannot be used. And also, something I would say a bit deeper that I want to investigate today is that it's not really the good notion of, of, of discrepancy. W what happens if you don't have the same number of points? And, and, and if you think about the, my, my initial slides, I even wanted to compare a, a discrete uh, data set to a continuous model. It could be a Gaussian, for instance, could be a continuous density. So you could even ask the question of mapping a continuous uh, distribution to a discrete one. So it, it looks like this is not the, the correct way to, to frame the, the question. So in fact, this problem was pretty much uh, forgotten for a long time until uh, Kantorovich, Leonid Kantorovich, a Russian mathematician, come with a very elegant solution. In fact, a relaxation. And it's really a relaxation in the sense of convex relaxation, because as you would see, it leads to a tractable convex optimization problem. And really, the, 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 the biggest move is to say we, we don't want to match point, but we rather want to match probability distribution. So here, I describe everything in discrete to simplify. But in fact, everything works also for continuous distribution. OK, but for this good case, uh, now you have the point xi and yj, but they are also equipped with mass or a probability or an histogram, if you want, ai and bj. And the only constraint is that they should have the same total mass. But now the number of points, of course, can be uh, uh, different. And, and the genius of Kantorovich, uh, for which actually he got the Nobel Prize in economy, uh, of course, a long time after, but it was a very strong recognition for his work, which is a pioneer work in the mathematical model of economy is to say that uh, you should uh, capture transportation or linkage between points, not by a bijection, but by what uh, it was uh, called at that time a transport plan, capital P, so plan as in planification. The goal was to do planification. And in modern probabilistic language, people call this a probabilistic coupling. But in discrete case, it's just a big array of positive number capital P. And each time you have a non-zero element in this array, Pij is non-zero. Uh, it simply means that you're going to transfer some amount of mass from xi to yj. So if you look at the first row of this array of numbers, you see there is a single non-zero purple dots, which means that uh, x1 is going to be transferred to some point uh, y1 uh, in, in, in a unique way. But if you look at the second row, okay, you see that now there is two non-zero elements, which means that the mass of the second point now is going to be split into two parts. And it's really the, the, the novelty here, the relaxation, is you allow yourself to split the mass to send two connections uh, to two different locations. So now what are the constraints of this uh, transportation coupling? Of course, it has to be positive, but it also has to satisfy conservation of mass, which means that all the mass from A needs to be distributed. So uh, in terms of equation, it means that if you sum the row of your P, you should find back the vector A. So in matrix vector notation, which is uh, very convenient, if you multiply P by one, you get the vector a. So p time 1 is equal to a. You sum on the row, and you recover a. And of course, you get the same thing if you sum on the column, and now you, you recover b. So why is it uh, meaningful? It's meaningful because these equations are linear. p1 equal a and p transpose 1 equal b are just linear equations. And then you get the positivity constraint, which is a convex uh, constraint. 
So what does it mean now to select the optimal transport plan uh, according to uh, Leonid Kantorovich? He made a very strong hypothesis, a very simplification, a, a huge simplification, of course, from an economic perspective, this is of course debatable. Uh, he, he, he said that uh, the price should be linear, the cost you pay should be linear. If you double the amount of mass you want to transport, you should double the price. Uh, once again, you could say in economy, it's not realistic, but it leads to a very simple equation because now you simply want to minimize the sum of cost time uh, the mass you transport. And I mean, you could put any cost, but usually what people would do is select the cost, which is the power of P. So you, you take some, some real number P and you raise the distance to the power of P. So for Monge, it was P equal one, but you can choose any P basically. So you just sum this uh, total cost and, and this is a, just a linear function. So according to Kantorovich, uh, optimal transport is simply what now is called linear programming. So it's also the birth of linear programming as, as we love and share it nowadays, which is used everywhere. I mean, it's re really used everywhere in industry. And this is just an example of, of linear programming, one of the, the very first. And in fact, uh, of course, if this was just a mathematical uh, equation, this would not be super useful. What makes this very, very impactful is at the, at the same time, uh, George Danzig, uh, a mathematician in the US, invented an algorithm, which you might know, it's called the simplex algorithm, which can solve very efficiently this type of problem. And, and in fact, and this was discovered, uh, not by Danzig, it was discovered uh, way, way, way after, almost like uh, 20 years after, is that on, on, on this type of question, of problem, in fact, the simplex algorithm can run in almost uh, cubic time complexity. So you see the difference before we had like, uh, exponential time for the brute force approach. And now for this relaxation, uh, you get a polynomial time algorithm. So this is really a huge breakthrough. And uh, I don't think I need to convince you that uh, simplex algorithm is, is very important. So maybe unfortunately only Kantorovich got the Nobel prize, uh, but I think it's fair to say that it's a combination of these two um, advances that makes linear programming and optimal transport uh, something very, very important because now you can solve it uh, in practice. Okay, so I, I could stop my talk now, but of course, as you might guess, this raises a lot of questions, a lot of difficulties. Well, first, cubic time is not so fast, right? So okay, can we do better? Uh, can we do something else? And also, how to use it uh, in, in machine learning in high dimension? Is it something that would work or not? And this is really what I want to discuss. And to understand this, I think the, the key move is, is to recognize that there's something more than, than just the, the, the uh, coupling P. Of course, the coupling is, is very nice, it allows you to interpolate or to link together a set of points. But in fact, if you look at the optimal cost, the cost of traveling between the two set of points, so you compute the optimal P and then the measure the cost. If you raise it to the power one over P, it defines a distance, or, or, or often like denoted WP, and often called the Wasserstein distance, uh, which is quite nice. It's, it means it's positive, it's a positive number. It, it satisfies the triangular inequality. And it's zero if and only if the, the two sets of points are equal, which is which is kind of obvious. Uh, triangular inequality is not totally obvious, by the way, but it's, it's quite uh, simple to prove. Uh, but maybe you can argue that, uh, why should I use this distance? I know a lot of other distances that uh, looks much simpler to compute. So the question is, what is so special about this distance? And, and a way to see this is to look at the topology induced by this distance. Why does it mean for two distribution to be close according to the Wasserstein distance? What does it mean in terms of convergence if you want to have a more um, rigorous mathematical statement? And in fact, at least if you are on a compact domain, so if you have a, a domain that is bounded, uh, it would mean that it corresponds to the convergence in law. It's actually a theorem that uh, the Wasserstein distance goes to zero if and only if uh, one distribution converges in law to the other one. And probably you know about the convergence in law from probability courses. If you have had a course on uh, central limit theorem, for instance, it's typically stated as a convergence in law uh, statement, but, but maybe more intuition about this is just to look at what it is corresponds to for uh, the red point cloud to converge in law to the blue uh, one. Somehow it means that the points are going to come closer together. So it's kind of a convergence, if you want, of the supports, but it's a bit more than this because of course we don't deal only with point, we deal with probability, which means that uh, in the limit, you can have uh, the fusion of red points together as, as, as ba basically in, as was uh, explained in the previous uh, slide with, with Kantorovich, you could have points that fuse together and the only restriction is, is uh, they should come closer and the mass when they fuse, it should be equal. So you could have two red points 
of mass, uh, let's say one half that fuse and then the limit, they are equal to a blue point of mass one. Okay, so, so, so I think a good intuition is convergence in law means convergence of position and equality of mass in the limit, which is kind of nice because this is exactly what we want in many uh, applied area where we want point cloud or distribution to be closer and closer together. What exactly is the motivation uh, for the first slide? Okay, Oops, sorry. So maybe to get some insight of why is it powerful and why is it different from more classical notion of distances, I, I would say the simplest distance between two distribution is uh, the L1 norm. So probabilist would rather call it uh, the total variation distance. But if, if you look in, in like uh, um, for the Lebesgue measure, if you look at density, this will simply correspond to the, to the L1 norm of probability distribution. So if you look in the simplest settings where you have just one Dirac mass that come closer to another one, uh, what happened for the Wasserstein distance? Well, it's kind of obvious because there is a single way to transport one point to another one. And if you look at the Wasserstein uh, formula, we raise the cost to the power p, but then to the power one over p. So really the Wasserstein distance uh, between two Dirac masses is, is just the distance itself between the points, which is really what you want. You have like really this injection of points inside probability distribution and then if you evaluate the distance on Dirac, uh, you recover the initial space. And, and in fact, you can show uh, there's a, lot of, a very nice paper by uh, Giuseppe Savare that, that proved that uh, more or less, it's the only formula that have this property. If you have for some basic continuity property, it's uh, the only way to have a distance that satisfies this, uh, this identity. But now if you look at the L1 norm, what is the L1 norm between two Dirac masses that are not exactly at the same position? So you make this Dirac, I don't know if you see my camera, but you have a Dirac and then another one, which is not at the same position. Then you make the subtraction. So you get the plus one and the minus one. And then you take the sum of the absolute value to compute the L1 norm. So it's going to be one plus one. So it's going to be equal to two. So the L1 norm between two Dirac is always equal to two. And uh, which means that according to L1, a Dirac that is progressively moving toward another one uh, is, is, is never uh, going to converge to the, okay, maybe I can try. It's, no, it's never going to converge to to uh, to uh, to its final position in total variation. So so it's often called a strong topology, the L1 topology, because it's kind of the natural topology on measure. But you see, there is a problem. It's kind of a too strong topology if you want to assess for like shifting in the in the in the support of the measure, for instance. Which I think is one of the reason why uh, Wasserstein is, is a is a very natural notion of, of distance. Okay, so I hope you're, you're, you're not convinced that it's actually <laughs> a useful tool. But now the question is, is, can you actually use it in practice? And what are actually the, the main drawback? Because there are like a lot of drawback uh, with this distance. Um, so one of the drawback, maybe I can already say this, it was uh, the computational cost. It cost n cube to compute exactly the Wasserstein distance, which, which is a bit too much. Um, related to this, in many applications, you don't really want to compute exactly the Wasserstein distance because, well, the data is noisy. So, well, maybe it makes sense to have only an approximate algorithm. And the other reason that I would explain after is in high dimension, uh, actually you need a lot of sample to compute uh, precisely the Wasserstein distance, which I'm going to discuss after. It turned out that there is a very natural way to address all this issue that was introduced uh, actually a long time ago, even before Kontorovich, uh, by entropic regularization. So it's often called a Schrodinger problem because it was introduced by Schrodinger uh, as a model for statistical physics. Uh, so at that time, he didn't know, of course, about optimal transport. Uh, Kontorovich didn't uh, get invented his, 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 his uh, formulation. But from a modern perspective, it simply corresponds to basically taking the initial uh, problem of Kontorovich and adding an entropic penalty. So adding epsilon time, uh, I mean, the neg entropy, so minus uh, Shannon-Boltzmann entropy. So it was really, so it's really like a revolution uh, because, uh, well, uh, Shannon theory was not uh, yet invented and optimal transport was not really uh, invented and, and he really discovered this formula before. And, and the uh, motivation for Schrodinger was not, of course, a military application. It was to model uh, the evolution of gas and in fact, to, to, to answer to the question, if you observe two particles of gas, so the Xi and the Yj are particles of gas, uh, but you don't know what happened between the, the, the time zero and time one, let's say, what are the most likely trajectory of the particles of gas? And in fact, it showed that uh, what statisticians would call the maximum likelihood estimator is actually the solution to this uh, optimization problem. And uh, for Schrodinger, epsilon is just the temperature of the gas. Okay, so for us, epsilon plays the role of a, of a penalty parameter. 
but for Schrodinger, it was really like a, a, a physical meaning. So, so I'm not going to discuss in more the physics. I'm going to discuss uh, why this is useful. Uh, a way to get uh, maybe some insight about the property of this problem is to do numerics. So I will explain after the algorithm. So, but let's assume we have an algorithm to solve this problem. Uh, what happens when epsilon increases? So when epsilon is zero, uh, of course, you recover Kantorovich problem. And if you assume you have the same number of particles of gas, uh, in fact, there is a very famous theorem, which is called uh, birkhoff von Neumann theorem, which was discovered in the 50s by, independently by Birkhoff and by von Neumann. In this case, uh, it can be shown that uh, Monge and Kantorovich are equivalent, meaning that there always exists a solution of Kantorovich, so a coupling capital P, which is a bijection, which is a permutation matrix. This is really what it means that uh, Kantorovich solves the problem of Monge. It means that if you solve with your favorite algorithm, like say the simplex Kantorovich problem, you're actually solving uh, the original Monge problem. Okay, so this is when epsilon is zero. And in fact, what you can also easily show if you know a bit uh, about entropic uh, method, uh, maximum entropy method. This is just like maximum entropy approaches to optimal transport. As soon as epsilon is strictly positive, in fact, you can show that capital P is going to be strictly positive. And I'm going to use it after it's because it can be explained or written in an ex exponential, in a, in a Gibbs energy manner. Uh, but as soon as epsilon is positive, capital P would be full. So everyone would be uh, connected to everyone. So here I'm simply displaying uh, a little segment each time capital P is larger than 10 to the minus 3. And you see what happens from left to right. If you increase the penalty, if you increase the temperature, you're going to connect more points and more points together. So, uh, well, is it useful? I mean, at this stage, uh, it's not clear. But what I would show after is that by linking more points together, you would have actually two very important benefits. Uh, first of all, uh, you would have a faster algorithm. OK, so this would be the first very important point that I would explain just after. And the other point is that it would be much more stable. So it's going to be very useful in high dimension to have a statistical efficiency. It would require less points to have a faithful approximation of uh, some kind of uh, optimal transport uh, distance. And I would discuss this after. OK, so uh, about the algorithm first, uh, there is a very nice algorithm that I, I like a lot. It's one of my favorite algorithms. Uh, maybe with the FFT. I mean, there is a few algorithms that I, I, I think I, I, uh, I um, was knowing about it because they are very nice. And it's called synchron algorithm. And I want to explain this uh, a bit in details. And, and the way to derive this algorithm is to start by the optimality condition of this optimization problem. Uh, since you have two constraints, so uh, constraints on the marginal P1 equal A and P transport 1 equal B, if you write down the Lagrange multiplier, you would have two Lagrange multipliers, U and V. So being optimal is equivalent to satisfy, of course, the conservation of mass equation. But at the same time, uh, you need to be able to write your capital P in an exponential manner, uh, or sometimes called a uh, scaling uh, formulation. And I want to describe this second equation in, in more details. Uh, the first ingredient is the Gibbs kernel. And the Gibbs kernel is very simple. It's just exponential of minus the cost uh, divided by epsilon. So if you take P equal 2 and you take the uh, Euclidean norm, uh, basically, the Gibbs kernel is just a big, big uh, Gaussian matrix. And what this, this equation tells you is that you should be equal, uh, able sorry, to multiply uh, the rows of capital K by U and the column by V, so two positive vectors of unknown, the scaling vector, so that capital P satisfies conservation of mass. And maybe the uh, simple uh, version is the case where A and B are equal to 1. So just uniform distribution on the same uh, number of points. In this case, the first equation, conservation of mass, means that capital P needs to be bistochastic. It needs to be a bistochastic matrix. So the question that is asked by Schrodinger is the following question. Can you always normalize uh, a matrix, a positive kernel capital K, by uh, normalizing the row and the column so that it becomes bistochastic? And in fact, it's a very deep and very uh, important question in, in statistics. It's not only in, 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 in uh, I would say, uh, optimal transport. And it was uh, asked a long time ago, even 100 years ago, you see people already using this algorithm to normalize array of number uh, without, of course, knowing that it was solving also Schrodinger problem. And uh, by this simple equivalence, I can first answer the question whether it's possible. The answer is yes, it's possible. And because the initial problem is a strictly convex optimization problem, there is a unique solution. So capital P is unique. So by the simple equivalence, I, I, I already proved that there is a unique uh, scaled bistochastic matrix. 
of course, the, the, the key question is how do you compute it in practice? Because of course, existence is nice, but it's not uh, very useful. And a, a way to derive this algorithm from a, I would say, heuristic perspective is to rewrite uh, the conservation of mass uh, equation, so P1 equal A, but introducing the fact that P should be written in terms of the Lagrange multiplier. So P should be written diag U, so multiplication on the left by U, time K times diag V. So if you input this and you multiply by the vector one, you get a very simple equation, this uh, row constraint equation. And when I put a dot with a little circle, uh, it means just uh, entry-wise multiplication. Okay, so uh, Kronecker or whatever you call it, uh, multiplication of two vectors. Uh, but when I write capital K times V, it's really the multiplication of this big matrix K by, by V, okay, it's matrix vector multiplication. So the first equation becomes quite simple. It's U multiplied by KV is equal to A. And the blue equation is just the same, but, but of course you reverse the role of, of U and V. It's like a symmetric, uh, symmetric equation. So uh, what this tells us is quite interesting. It means that solving Schrodinger problem, so like approximate optimal transport, is the same as solving basically two equations with two unknown that actually are quadratic equation in U and V. But the catch is it's very high dimensional equation. How can you solve it uh, in practice, I would say? Well, there is an, a, 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 a way to do it is to solve each one equation and then the other one, because of course, if you give me capital uh, small v, sorry, there is a, a simple way to solve the first equation. Uh, you just divide. So when I put a little bar like this, it means like entry-wise division. Uh, you divide a by k times v, and this solves the first equation. But now it's like a chick chicken and egg problem. You need to solve both at the same time. So what do you do? You simply iterate between the red and the blue, and uh, you just hope it converges. And the beauty or the nice good news, I would say, is that Syncom proved in 64 that it converges. Actually, it's a beautiful uh, mathematical paper because it shows that it's not only converging, it's contracting. And it contracts toward the solution. So uh, you can actually have a fast uh, speed of convergence. So I think it's also one uh, of my favorite paper. Uh, and this why I like to call it Syncorn because it's not the one that invented the algorithm, but, but it's a mathematician that actually shows that it converges in a, in a nice way. So what are the good news? The good news, it converges. Uh, <laughs> it converges. Uh, the good or bad news is that, of course, if epsilon goes uh, small, then the convergence would be very slow. So it's an algorithm that works great if epsilon is not too small. But the, the other good news is I would explain after what, why in practice you don't want to use a, a small epsilon anyway. Uh, so if epsilon is not too small, the algorithm uh, would converge. The other good news is it's a super simple algorithm. So if you have ever tried to implement si simplex once in your life, uh, I think you know it's not so easy to implement. But here it's really... Uh, basically very simple iteration. And, and the only cost, the only computational cost is simply multiplication by a matrix, uh, which is very simple to implement. And also if you have a GPU, so graphical processor units, then it's, it's, it's super powerful. So I think one of the, of, of, the, of the key paper in this area is the one by Marco Cuturi a few years ago that really uh, explained that this algorithm is, is, uh, is amazing if you implement it on, on GPU. You really gain order of magnitude which is one of the reasons why uh, optimal transport gains a lot of uh, momentum, I would say, in machine learning is because people have, have started using uh, this algorithm on GPU. Like when you typically train neural network, you, you are already uh, have your data on the GPU and then you gain a, uh, you gain a lot, okay? So it's, it's simple, it's parallelizable and, uh, and, 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 and it's converged quite fast if, if epsilon is not too small. But once again, if you want to pick a small epsilon because you would like to be very accurate according to the original problem, then there's no free lunch, it would, be, it would be slow. And actually it's a theorem that you can never be faster than n cube if you want to solve exactly optimal transport. But this is not the goal, okay? The goal is not to solve exactly optimal transport. I think it's a very important take home message that in most applications, we are perfectly fine with a crude uh, approximation. Why, I mean, and, and a striking uh, reason for this is the curse of dimensionality. And I think it's something that I really want to insist is that in high dimension, it's impossible to compute optimal transport. It would cost too much, okay? A, a typical scenario is you have a discrete measure. So sorry, I switched the color. So before the blue was discrete, but now it's the red that is discrete, uh, like your input data set. And you want to compare it to a continuous model beta. But of course, I mean, you need to, to compute it on a computer. So you need to sample from beta. You need to discretize your numerical problem. So the question is how many samples do you need? Do you need eight samples? Do you need 23 samples? Do you need a billion samples? Uh, of course, this, this depends on, on, on the task you want to solve. But if your task is, is a very simple task, 
you just want to compute the optimal transport distance, then it's impossible. And this is a theorem that was proved uh, by Richard Dudley in 68, but it was generalized uh, after. Uh, it was proved in the Euclidean space, but it can be generalized to a lot of other costs. Is that if you want to reach some precision delta, let's say 10 to the minus 3, for instance, uh, then the number of sample you need is going to be 1 over delta to the power of the dimension. So you imagine if you are uh, in dimension uh, 1,000, uh, the number of samples would be like, uh, like gigantic. So e even if the, if the model are very simple, even, even if it's a Gaussian distribution, if nobody tells you before it's a Gaussian, then you can never guess it uh, by applying simplex algorithm. So this is the bad news. Uh, optimal transport is intractable like this in high dimension. Of course, it's tractable if you have some, inf some additional information. But you can show actually this theorem is optimal. You can never improve over this bound. So it's a typical example of curse of dimensionality. So of course, what we, we try to, 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 to do is to understand it, what, what is the situation with uh, Schrodinger problem. And I want to insist that this is not curing the curse of dimensionality of, of optimal transport. This is really, if you're interested in, in Schrodinger problem, how much sample do you need to, to have an accurate uh, uh, computation of, of the cost of Schrodinger problem? And this was studied by uh, Ojen Vey, which was a PhD student uh, co-supervised uh, by Marco Couturier and myself. And, and, and what she proved is that as soon as epsilon is strictly positive, the number of sample you need is one over delta to the square. Okay, so there is no uh, dependency on the dimension. And this type of result is exactly the same as you would have with Monte Carlo method. Uh, I guess you have been told, and I've been told, and a lot of people say that Monte Carlo method, they don't suffer to the curse of dimensionality because, uh, well, the number of sample uh, in terms of, of convergence uh, with respect to, to, to the precision is independent of the dimension. And it's exactly the same it's just a bit more complicated, uh, but, 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 but typically um, the type of, of analysis is similar. So Schrodinger problem is just not computing an integral. It's a bit more complicated, but it has a similar flavor. Uh, and I will answer the question just after. Um, now the bad news, of course, there is no free lunch. Very similar to Monte Carlo method is that the dimension is typically hidden in the constant. And here you can show that unfortunately the constant then blows with the dimension and with epsilon is one over epsilon to the dimension. So you see what happens is if epsilon is small, then this constant would be enormous. But this is to be expected because we know before that uh, we cannot really compute optimal transport efficiently. So if you would like to compute accurately optimal transport, you need epsilon to be super small and then you recover the curse of the dimensionality. Uh, so this is in line. So, so the take home message of this, uh, and I'm sorry, we don't have more theory for now, but, but it's a starting point of a, a very interesting question is if you want to use a uh, Simcorn or Schrodinger in practice, then in high dimension, it's possible provided that epsilon is not too small. Now, the good question is, is besides just computing this cost, what do you do with it? Is it something that would work in practice for like meaningful question uh, in machine learning? And this, uh, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, uh, there is no theory. So we, we rely on numerics. Uh, there was a question about unbalanced optimal transport. So I will not answer in detail because I've decided not to speak about unbalanced optimal transport. Uh, just a few words. So unbalanced optimal transport is a generalization where you want to compare two distributions with not exactly the same mass and you want to allow for mass variation. And, and we wrote several papers on this. And the short answer is yes. In fact, everything I've said today works exactly the same for unbalanced optimal transport. So think on algorithm works. Uh, curse of dimensionality is the same and uh, Schrodinger problem has the same type of behavior. So basically everything you, you see in my slide, you can replace uh, optimal transport with unbalanced optimal transport and it works exactly the same. So I think it's uh, good news. It's to be expected because unbalanced optimal transport has almost the same equation. So, so there is not uh, huge difficulty, but it's nice to know that uh, this is kind of a, Syncon is very flexible, okay? Uh, I've spoke a bit about like, optimal transport, but there is many problems that can benefit from Syncon. Uh, for instance, wasserstein barry Center, uh, I'm not going to speak about. I just want to, to basically uh, to, to, to give credit to these two guys, so to Guillaume and Marshall. So Marshall died a few years ago from cancer. So unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. But his legacy is uh, many, many beautiful papers, many beautiful theorems, among which uh, deep study of barry Center of measure. Uh, and, and we are very happy with Guillaume. We worked a bit, uh, not with Marshall, uh, unfortunately, but we work on Syncon for... for Wasserstein Barry Center and, 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 and it also works very nicely. So Syncon is quite, it's something you can use and, and it's quite flexible to solve uh, other types of, of application. But, but I've not, I'm not going to speak more because I will run out of time. But if you're interested, uh, just send me an email so, or we can discuss after the talk, uh, of course. 
Okay, so um, now I want to conclude a bit uh, to speak about uh, potential application, um, discuss a bit what you can do. Uh, but uh, just, just as a disclaimer, there would be no theory in this final part of the talk, unfortunately. Uh, this would be like basically experiments. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry about this, but, but to the best of my knowledge, there is almost no theory. Uh, first, back to the initial question, uh, type of question you want to solve with optimal transport that maybe you, you want to solve. Uh, maybe you're not using optimal transport, and maybe you, it's a good it's a good opportunity maybe to switch uh, or not maybe because it's too complicated. I don't know. Uh, the question is like basic question of density fitting or um, parameter estimation. I've already said this. Uh, you have some uh, template alpha that depend on theta theta sorry, and you want to find the optimal parameter theta. What would be the standard approach to this? It would not be based on optimal transport typically. I think the most standard approach is often called a maximum likelihood estimation or MLE, because it's more, more complicated stuff, but the most basic equation is uh, you want to maximize the probability of seeing these blue points, assuming that the model is alpha. So what does it correspond to in, in mathematical language? Uh, it corresponds to assuming that alpha has some density uh, rho. But of course, it depends on theta. So for any theta, you assume you have some density rho with respect to a fixed a reference measure or dx could be anything. It's not really important. Uh, could be Lebesgue, for instance, but it plays no role in the analysis. Now, uh, what is the probability of appearance of a point? It's going to be rho theta of xi. And of course, if you make the very simplifying and very nice assumption that the rho points are drawn independently, then you want to maximize the product of rho theta applied to xi. Since you prefer minimizing and you prefer a sum of uh, uh, products, and typically you take minus the log, and then you get the famous equation of MLE estimation, which is minimizing minus the sum of the log of, of rho theta. I don't find it super enlightening written like this, but maybe a way to, to have a, um, I would say a simpler expression is to look at what happens when the number of points become very large. Of course, the problem becomes simpler, but to get some insight about what you want to do when you have a lot of points, if you assume uh, n grows, then in fact, this discrete sum is like an approximation of an integral if you want. And this would correspond, if you look at the left-hand side, to minimizing what is often called uh, the relative entropy, so which is often called also Kullback labeler divergence uh, between beta and alpha. So Kullback labeler, you can think of this as some kind of a distance-like function. It's something that is zero and it's positive, and it's zero if and only if beta is equal to two alpha. A bit like the L1 norm, if, if, if you want. Um, so uh, somehow, MLE methods, they try to minimize some distance between beta and your model. It's fairly nice. You get a lot of, of nice theory about it. It could be optimal in, in, in many aspects. Uh, for instance, if the model is Gaussian, then you recover uh, the classical formula for the mean and the covariance. But of course, if the model is more complicated, and in particular, if we think about uh, deep learning, then there is no closed form equation. So you need to minimize it with, with well, some optimization algorithm, uh, which is, I mean, routinely done in many, uh, many deep learning pipelines. So now what is wrong with it, or could be wrong, is of course log of zero. It's well defined if rho is 3D positive, but if you have zeros, then this is going to be undefined or at least very problematic. And a typical scenario where uh, this singularity arrives, so if you, where you don't have typically a solution, is uh, what people nowadays often refer to to generative models. It, it's, uh, it's like a common word for a class of approaches where you don't give a closed form uh, expression for rho. So you actually don't really care, and it would be very complicated to compute rho. Uh, but instead, you describe the generative process to sample from rho, or alpha, rather. So you say, uh, how do I sample from my model? I draw a point at random in a low-dimensional uh, Latin space, capital Z. Could be a uniform distribution, for instance, in dimension, let's say, 10 or maybe 50, but not so large. And then you map it to your high-dimensional space by a function g that depends on theta. And of course, here, what people have in mind is uh, deep models, deep uh, network, so very complicated function g that input a low dimensional vector and output a high dimensional vector. So you see what happened is in high dimension, the model would live on some kind of a surface, if you want, that is parameterized by theta. And as you modify uh, your weight vector theta, the surface is going to be deformed. And the goal is to deform this surface so that it becomes as close as possible to theta. And now you see the problem is the distribution alpha is actually zero almost everywhere. Since you start by low dimensional space in high dimensional space, uh, the MLE is not defined. So 
this is well known. I'm not claiming we are the first one to notice this. It's something that uh, everybody says is that in order to use MLE in high dimension, you need to regularize your MLE. You need to, to do something. There's many ways to do this, like for instance, adding noise to the problem to regularize the density. But this is a bit ad hoc. So could you do this in a more uh, mathematically rigorous way? Well, if you want to do it, you need to replace Kullback labeler by a distance which is robust to, to, to deformation. And this is exactly the goal of, of optimal transport. Optimal transport is the distance which does exactly uh, this notion of matching between uh, two different point clones in, in a geometrical way. So of course, the price to pay is that it's going to be super costly because even computing the Wasserstand itself, it's, sorry, distance itself is costly, uh, let alone uh, minimizing it. So here we are like adding a, another layer on top of what I've said previously. You don't only want to compute it, you want to minimize it. I'm not going to describe uh, what generative networks are, but, but uh, roughly speaking, if you know about deep network, deep network, they usually compute some feature embedding, some low dimensional vector to represent your data, to do discrimination, classification. But here, what we are trying to do is rather the other way around. We start by a latent vector of low dimension, so little z, and we want to increase its dimension so that it defines the nice images. So somehow, generative network, they correspond to classical network, but reversed. You reverse the order of the uh, layers and you can progressively grow uh, a big images. Um, so I think it's a, it's a very intriguing construction, it's very non-trivial. Uh, I mean, it's, it's trivial from an um, architectural perspective, but what it does is, is kind of, of non-trivial. It's often called also uh, the convolution network because uh, classical network for images, they operate convolution and here somehow you deconvolve. You, you play reverse in reverse order uh, the convolution. Okay. Uh, I'm not al also going to speak about optimization because it's fairly non trivial. Uh, why it's fairly non trivial? Because you would like to do a gradient descent of this energy that depend on theta, like the Schrodinger cost, for instance. Um, but of course, beta is a continuous density. So you cannot do it like this. So you need to use stochastic gradient method. You need to sample your uh, models. And typically, you also need to sample your data because your data is usually huge, which give you like noisy gradients. So stochastic gradient corresponds to uh, minimizing, but with, with noisy gradients. And unfortunately, in this case, we are not in the classical setup of, of supervised learning. Uh, the gradient is biased. You have a bias in the gradient because you're not minimizing an expectation. So all the theorem you know about uh, classical SGDs, they don't work in this case. And, and you would typically not converge to the true solution. Where do you converge? Nobody really knows. It seems to work fine, but to tell you the truth, it's something that uh, remains uh, totally open. I think uh, uh, when you apply SDD to very complex uh, functional, it's not clear what happens. But okay, people, you can try it and it kind of work. Typically what you would do, and this is the good news, is you implement your neural network in PyTorch, JAX, TensorFlow, whatever. Then you implement in the same software uh, sync corn, and then you just uh, press the button and you ask uh, the optimizer to do it, and it would use automatic differentiation uh, to compute the, the optimization. So, um, so from a, I would say, numerical perspective, it's it's pretty obvious. If you know about how to code a neural network, sync corn is just like a, another no, neural network. If you want. Okay, so once again, no theory. I'm just like trying to explain to you the practice of, of optimal transport. About the numerics, uh, OK, the good news is if you apply it to simple data, it works fine. But on simple data, like in this uh, data sets, uh, you, can, you don't need optimal transport. There's many methods that works fine. Uh, if you apply it to more complex uh, data, like uh, typically uh, people like to use it on faces, uh, it gives garbage. It doesn't give very nice uh, faces. Uh, the reason is pretty clear is uh, optimal transport here, if you use it with the Euclidean distance, is not really good basically because the Euclidean distance between phase is not a very good notion of, of distance. So the question is, how do you compute an efficient or a good notion of distance? How do you do uh, metric learning? And it's, it's, it's like adding another layer of difficulty. And one proposal that was, was made uh, a few years ago by uh, Jan Goodfellow and collaborator is to also train another network. So they call this uh, generative adversarial network, GANs, and then they train it and uh, it corresponds somehow to, to, to learning a metric in the optimal transport. It's not the way they, they, um, they explain the method, but this is more or less equivalent to actually training uh, with another network, the metric you use for optimal transport. So, so I'm just like saying that this is very interesting, but also 
uh, raises a lot of, of mathematical question about what type of metric do you learn? Uh, can you even learn a metric in high dimension? I, I think nobody really knows. But in practice, it seems to give quite good results. I would say that GAN, we are quite of, uh, kind of limited because uh, it's actually very hard to train, to optimize in practice. And now people have switched to other models, which are called diffusion models. I don't know if you have heard about this, but it's another class of model, uh, which uh, quite in a funny way are also related to optimal transport, okay, uh, which makes sense because uh, you also try to model probability distribution. But I'm not going to speak about this uh, today. Uh, okay, so I think it's time, or oh, I can show some pretty picture. It's actually uh, for uh, almost uh, five years ago now, it's a paper from NVIDIA that uh, in a funny way actually uses optimal transport. So we were quite happy to see that uh, even in, in very applied uh, applied um, literature, they actually use at some point optimal transport to improve the results. Here you see uh, what they like to do in a generative model. You train the network and then you visualize what's happened by uh, typically drawing a line in Latin space, and you look at the image of this line um, in uh, the generated space. Okay, so here it's not displaying an optimal transport, it's displaying just a, just a little segment on the surface of a generated uh, faces. So fake, fake images, if you want. Uh, sometimes it works, but sometimes it gives like totally crazy results, so it's not so clear if it's useful or not. Uh, but if you've, if you've heard about uh, DLE, for instance, it's also the type of things that are uh, behind the scene. Although they use more complex uh, neural network. Okay, it's time to conclude. Uh, first, I want just to advertise for this nice theory because I think uh, I enjoy a lot when there is a nice theory and it's quite uh, the case for optimal transport, a long string of work culminating by uh, the work of Alessio Figali, who got the Hill medals uh, for uh, understanding or analyzing, let's say, the regularity of optimal transport. But I think in, in all fields, so I would say more applied, the uh, machine learning uh, type field, there is new question that arise, which have not been touched by, by mathematicians, which have been driven mostly by physics applications, which are like 3D or 6D applications. Here in machine learning, we want to do optimal transport or PDE if you want, because optimal transport is connected to PDE in high dimension. And of course, it's, it changes everything. As soon as the dimension enters the picture, a uh, lot of theorems, they become meaningless and you need to find new theorems and to study new quantities. And I think Syncon is an example of a quantity that deserves, uh, I would say, more attention, uh, certainly. Uh, then I want to uh, also open to new type of question, new type of problems. And one thing that is fascinating is there's many applications where you want to do optimal transport across two different spaces. And in this case, it's not clear what should be the cost because the data belongs to two different spaces. An example here is in uh, multi-omics data set, so in genomics where you record the cells, but you might have two different technology and they acquire the sample in two different spaces. And there is a nice extension that, of course, I would not describe, which is called uh, gromov wasserstein which integrates IDs from uh, Gromov, which requires to solve, unfortunately, a non-convex optimization problem. So it's kind of a non-convex optimal transport. And I think it's very, very interesting because uh, nothing is known. For instance, uh, existence of optimal transport in this setup is, is in some cases even an open question because the problem is non convex, you cannot use a classical tool. So I hope uh, this would stimulate uh, people in the audience, uh, young mathematicians, or not young, uh, any, anyone is welcome to join, to study uh, all these questions, which are, I think, very interesting. And I thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, I'd be very happy to answer. Thank you, Gabriel. And uh, there are some questions. So this is the first one. Do you know about an application of optimal transport to solve PDE? Is it possible to develop like, a kernel that employs a vast certain distance to employ the kernel trick? Oh, so these are very good questions, very sharp questions. <laughs> so there are actually two questions, so let me address them in order. Uh, the first thing is about like using optimal transport to solve partial differential equations. So I don't know who in the audience is familiar with it, but it turned out, and I didn't spoke about this, one of the most, uh, I would say, the culmination of optimal transport is the definition of so-called uh, gradient flows, Wasserstein gradient flows which allows to express some partial differential equation, like, P, like typically diffusion or even nonlinear diffusion or sometimes more complex nonlinear PDE, as minimization of an energy according to Wasserstein distance. So this was introduced by Jordan Kinderlecher and Otto, so it's called DKO. And it's very powerful and very interesting. So it can be used as a tool to prove first existence of solution. There's, there are some PDEs that are very complicated and it's not clear 
like if the function is not very smooth, whether there are solutions or if the solution exists. And this could be used as a theoretical tool. And now people are also trying to use it as a numerical tool to solve the equation. Uh, it has some advantage because you can use larger step size and also it enforces positivity. So for some very uh, degenerate equation, I think it can be useful. For not so complicated equation, uh, I think it's too costly. In practice, you might probably want to use simpler tool like just like classical uh, earlier schemes or like classical explicit schemes. So I wrote a paper on this if you're interested where we use uh, Syncorn as a tool to solve a non-linear uh, non differential equation. I think it's competitive if, uh, if the driving term is very non-smooth and very complicated. For instance, some applications are for uh, modeling evolution of crowds. It was introduced by, uh, by uh, Mori and Santambrogio and uh, others at Orsay. And uh, it's a kind of a useful tool in this setup to model uh, congestion phenomena where you have people that, that uh, have to go through a small hole and they are uh, blocked. And, uh, and Syncon is actually good because it can really track this uh, singularity. So, okay, so I would say it can be used, but it's, 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 it's still a slow method. Uh, the other thing is use, uh, so this is a technical uh, expert question, is uh, you can compute Wasserstein distance, it's a distance. And then the question is, can you use it uh, to do kernelized, uh, kernelized uh, learning method, like kernel SVM or logistic regression? Uh, from a mathematical perspective, you cannot, because the Wasserstein distance is not an Euclidean distance. It cannot be embedded in Euclidean space. Uh, so in dimension larger than two, it doesn't define a positive uh, kernel. But in practice, I think it still works. So from a theoretical perspective, it's not clear. In practice, you can just compute the kernel. Then you discard the uh, negative eigenvalues, and then you can use it. So you can somehow correct the kernel. So it seems to work. I'm not claiming it's the best method, but uh, in practice, you can. Uh, what other people have been doing is to replace Wasserstein by a positive uh, Euclidean metric derived from Wasserstein. Uh, there is two ways to derive an Euclidean metric from Wasserstein. The first way is to just use 1D optimal transport because the 1D optimal transport is very specific. It can be shown that it's, uh, it's actually an Euclidean distance uh, between the, what is called the, the, uh, I mean the inverse cumulative function. So if you only use 1D optimal transport, so you can project your data in a lot of 1D lines, and then you can use a kernel on this. But, but of course, it's not optimal transport. It's like another distance. Uh, another way is to linearize optimal transport. You can compute uh, some kind of a linearized version of optimal transport. So if you use Wasserstein as a, as a geodesic distance, uh, you can compute somehow uh, tangent space if you want. And then you can compute this. And of course, then it becomes Euclidean. So, so the answer is, uh, to the second question is yes and no. No, you cannot use directly, uh, but you can do approximation and then use this uh, in kernel method. And it seems to work quite well uh, in many applications. But there is okay. no theory. So once again, if there are people, uh, theoreticians in the room, uh, I think there is a great opportunity to, uh, to do theory uh, on Wasserstein for, uh, for learning. We have another question by Joanne Francina. Going back to, was, uh, to what uh, your student, the young mm -hmm. fellow, did. And he said, in which sense that Abugan learned the ground matrix? Could you please say that again? Yes, so, so I was very quick on this, so I, I'm not expecting people to understand really. So it was kind of a, of a quick slide. Uh, so, so vanilla GANs is not framed in terms of uh, either Wasserstein or, or ground metric learning. Wasserstein GAN is in, indeed I mean, framed as a Wasserstein loss where you optimize on the dual metric. So it's not framed the way I, I wrote it. So strictly speaking, GANs is not optimizing any metric, uh, but very closely, so you can make some kind of connection between this. Um, if you write just down the equation above, sorry, like this, uh, I don't know where it was written, sorry. Uh, okay, like minimizing the Wasserstein distance between alpha oh, and beta. Ah, th thanks. So uh, here you see on the, the last equation, you need to minimize some Wasserstein distance between the model and beta. So you minimize on the generative network, uh, but you can also uh, introduce another network. Sorry, I have to switch slides. Uh, which parameterize the cost. And then the idea is you want to not minimize the Wasserstein distance, but maximize it. So you want to learn a generative network that minimizes the Wasserstein distance and a discriminative network that parameterize the cost that maximize it. Okay, so, 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 so this plays the role of the discriminator. So, and the equations are very close to GANs, uh, actually. 
kind of funny. I think it was never, I mean, never clearly written anywhere. But I think it's um, also a nice question, a theoretical question, to see if this could be proved mathematically that uh, somehow some like maybe modified version of GAN actually would correspond to, to this equation of metric norm. So once again, in this setup, you are not solving a minimization problem uh, as in GANs, you're solving a, a saddle point problem where you minimize on the generative network the Wasserstein distance and you maximize on the discriminative network the same Wasserstein distance. Okay. okay. By Giovanni, is it obvious that the Wasser sign type of projection of the Wander sample over a given distribution implied by the Mugen as a solution? Uh, in full generality, no. I think this has been studied, uh, probably not for a neural network. I think neural network, I mean, usually, I mean, it depends on, on what you want to study. Uh, so, usually, neural network, I mean, to fix the size is going to be a, a uh, a finite dimensional space, so somehow it would be a the, the, the space of alpha would be compact. So I think, strictly speaking, if, if, if you fix the architecture, it's going to have a solution and it's clear. But I think people are interested in the large limit where the, the network will become very, very expressive, in which case the class of alpha theta might become totally crazy. So in full generality, I think it's not clear. Uh, and I think people have studied mathematically some simplified version, typically where you don't use... Uh, any network or you, you or you simplify the, the type of function you, you are using to define the constraints uh, in which in which settings I think you can prove existence. But uh, to be honest, if, if you look at the type of network people would use in practice, uh, if you use very, very deep network, I think the space of alpha might become very complicated and it's not clear uh, existence is, is, is true. And I think it's a, it's a difficult question. And this question is a bit bypassed in the Wasserstein GAN paper because uh, somehow they don't really say anything. They say, okay, if the network is large enough, it should approximate any continuous function and, and life will be nice. But in practice, uh, I think it's not very clear what type of function you model with very deep network. And, um, and uh, well, I think these questions are, are mostly open. Okay, it seems to me that uh, there are no more questions. So we thank again uh, Gabriella for uh, this enlightening uh, seminar and we give you an appointment in uh, two weeks. Hello to everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks a lot, Justina, for the welcoming uh, session and hope to see you uh, in Roma uh, in real life at some point. Yes, absolutely. Yeah.